My, my name is uh, Edgar Jember. I'm from uh, UKZN. Um, um, I, I teach natural language processing. I have not done a lot of research in natural language processing. Uh, most of the work that I do is in belief change. Um, but I'm going to just give a, br a brief overview of what I do understand on how um, some techniques that are emanating from um, deep learning are um, affecting um, natural, language, uh, natural language processing. Uh, so this is an overview of my presentation. So I'll just give some NLP preliminaries. Uh, then I'll look at meaning representation. Um, so I'm just going to look at uh, SVD best methods for meaning uh, representation and iteration based method for meaning representation. The iteration based ones, those are the ones which are based on neural networks, not necessarily deep neural networks. They are based on neural networks, but they are usually used uh, when you extend it to lang um, natural language processing techniques that use um, deep neural networks. Uh, then I'll look at um, RNNs for language modeling. Um, and I'll explain what uh, language modeling is, and I'll look specifically at long, short-term memory and uh, gated recurrent, um, recurrent units. Um, just some, an overview of NLP tasks. Um, so I've got on the green there uh, some NLP tasks which are mostly solved. Um, so usually algorithms that I use for those tasks, they get close to 100%, percent, 90 something percent, uh, and what have you. So you've got your spam detection. Uh, that's a mostly solved problem. Spam detectors are very good. Um, they get very good accuracy in disp um, detecting spam. Uh, then you've got part of speech. I think um, most of you might have heard something about part of speech. You've got your words. They can have word classes like your verbs, nouns, adverbs, and what have you. Um, um, so you would want a machine to be able, given some text, you want a machine to be able to give the correct part of speech tags. Uh, and that's also a mostly solved uh, problem. Uh, then you've got named ended recognition. This is very much important for information extraction. Uh, what you would want to do is you've got your running text. Um, you would want to get all the named entities within, within that text. All together, you want to have your, all the named entities within that text. That's a mostly solved um, uh, problem. Uh, on these ones in the middle, uh, good progress has been made. Um, uh, the solutions that have been proposed there, they are doing well, but not as much as those ones on that side. So you've got a sentiment analysis. I do understand quite a number of people are interested in sentiment analysis. That's where you would want to look at reviews. You want to check whether a review is positive or is negative um, um, uh, concerning a certain business. Usually people will combine named ended uh, uh, sentiment analysis with named ended recognition. You've got a review with some named entities. You want to check the sentiment. Is it positive for this entity? Is it negative for the other entity? And what a view. Um, so the ones which we do have here, I will not go through all of them. They are, they are, they are good progress have been made in solving those. Uh, these ones are, are, are the difficult ones. These are difficult to solve. Um, a, a lot of work still need to be done there. Uh, question answering, we, I think we're all aware of the IBM Watson. It does well in question answering, but it's still a difficult, diff difficult problem. Paraphrasing, XYZ acquired ABC yesterday. Uh, ABC had been taken over by XYZ. You want a machine to be able to paraphrase um, uh, what is given um, in another form, in another text, summarization, dialogue, these are um, uh, very difficult uh, tasks. But what is the major problem in, um, in um, natural language processing? Um, ambiguity is the biggest problem. Um, us as human beings, as we speak to each other, we can be able to get uh, the word senses, the meaning carried by the utterances just from the context. But machines might not be able to, uh, to do so. So we've got that one, natural language processing, um, um, that, that's that, I mean, that my topic is about natural language processing. Is it um, natural processing of languages or is it processing of languages, uh, so that, uh, of natural languages? So that, that's the ambiguity you have. Uh, and you would want your machine to be able to see, um, um, to decode such, um, such ambiguities. Uh, teacher strikes idle kids. These are usually your newspaper articles which journalists use to sell some newspapers. Um, would the machine be able to see from the context what that, um, what's the meaning being carried by that, uh, that sentence? Uh, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Uh, there is some ambiguity there. Uh, we call it attachment ambiguity. We have got a prepositional phrase in my pajamas. We don't know whether it's attached to the verb or it's attached to, um, to, um, to the nominal phrase, uh, the noun phrase elephant in my pajamas. So you've got and we agree here, you don't know whether this prepositional phrase is attached to this nominal phrase, or is it attached to this verb, uh, verb phrase. And um, um, you, so you would want to be able to get the sentence of the structure so that you can be able to decode the correct meaning being carried by, by a given sentence. 
Um, then we also have got part of ambiguity in part of speech, um, part of speech tagging. The word rest can either be a noun or a verb. Um, and in this context, definitely we know it's supposed to be a verb. Um, how can a machine tell that the correct part of speech tag for, uh, for the word rest is a verb? Uh, so th those are the ambiguities you do deal with in natural language processing. This, um, I, I put it there, you, I remember last year there was a soccer player who was interviewed and mm -hmm. he said, I would want to thank my wife and my girlfriend. He said, sorry, mm -hmm. I think you said you had missed something. Um, and on that, sen on that statement, would you say, would say um, did Jim mean he has got a wife and a girlfriend or the wife is the girlfriend? Those are two meanings that can be carried there. Sorry. The picture of the wifey, my wife said this one looks more wifey. So I put this one as the wife and this one as the girlfriend. Uh, but we don't know what's the meaning being carried here. Is it the, this one is a wife and a girlfriend or does he have a wife and a girlfriend? So you've got a lot of ambiguity. So in general, when you've got ambiguity, uh, statistical models is the way to go. Uh, so your traditional uh, natural language processing techniques, they are based on, um, on statistical models. Uh, they usually use your Markov chains and a lot of conditional independence assumptions. Uh, so a traditional NLP is, is mainly based on that. Are we together? So if you, uh, you see a textbook which was written about, say, five years ago um, on natural language processing, it will be using those statistical models. Are we together? But recently, the emergence of deep learning um, have brought in new models that can be used, um, which are neural network-based models that can be used for NLP tasks. And, uh, they are doing very, they are doing very, very well. Uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll look at some of those models which have been inspired by the emergence of um, of deep learning, uh, and I'll look for I'll look at models for meaning representation. I'll also look for models for uh, sequential modeling. You can see your NLP data; it's a sequence of words, so you would want to be able to model those sequence words. The reason why we use Markov chains in statistical models is because we want to capture the sequence in there. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the data. Uh, so for meaning representation, the traditional way of um, um, capturing meaning in, in words um, um, or in sentences is usually to use um, a thesaurus or word net or some kind of um, a lexicon. Um, so we have the meaning of a word, like for instance, you've got the word good, you have to get its sin set. The sin set gives just a set of uh, synonyms for, the, for that word. So, so your word net usually it will list the words um, de uh, depending on the word senses they are carrying. And it, the most frequent one will be um, sense one, sense two, as it goes. Uh, so this is just giving the list of words that are synonyms um, uh, to, the word, uh, to the word good. Um, another concept which is used in, um, in, 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 a, in, in a resource like WordNet is the concept of subsumption relationship. Uh, you want to know whether a concept is uh, part of a given, a given concept. So you might have um, the word panda and you're taking sense one of the word panda. What are the super concepts, the hyper concepts of, um, of the word panda? Then it's listing all the, the different hyper concepts that you do, uh, you do have. Um, but what are the problems with these with this techniques? Uh, the first one is um, the word um, good proficient was given as a, syn a synonym to the word good. Uh, but we know that those words are not, this, they don't carry the same sense um, in, in some contexts. In some contexts, they may carry the same sense, but in some, they might not be able to do so. Uh, so we would want to know what is the similarity, what is the distance between those, um, those, those two concepts. Uh, and word net resource will not, it, it will give us, but it's not, it's not a complete, um, a complete uh, measure of similarity that it does give us. Uh, it misses some new words. Um, so you, now we have got words like tweet, spam, tablet and like, um, which had a different sense. Uh, but now the common use of those words are now is now carrying another different sense. And uh, if you've got a resource like WordNet, we'll not be able to, uh, to capture such senses. Uh, it requires a lot of um, labor to, human labor to create and maintain. Um, create and WordNet is an ontology and creation of ontology is a whole engineering process that involves um, a lot of um, human resources that are needed to just to keep create it and uh, to maintain it. Um, and the other issues doesn't uh, complete, um, uh, give complete, complete accurate computation of, uh, of similarity. Um, so what has happened with the emergence of deep learning is um, people are looking at different ways in which we can have meaning representation. There are two ways we can look at it. Uh, we can represent words um, as discrete symbols or we can choose to represent the meaning of a word based on the Kanban that they do keep. 
Um, so what is within the context, when a word appears in a context, um, what the words within the context can actually help us to get the meaning the word is actually, is actually carrying. Um, so if we represent um, words as discrete symbols, uh, one way of doing it is to use your one word uh, vector representation. Uh, so I've got the word motel and hotel. We know they mean, they mean the same thing. Uh, so if you want to have a representation of this, we'll create a vector space uh, which is um, as big as the vocabulary that we do have. And each and every word we have an index in the vector space. Are we together? Uh, so if you want to have one word representation of the word motel, you have zeros everywhere and one on the index that corresponds to the word motel. Uh, you do the same with the word hotel. Uh, but we know these words are similar. Uh, so if we now use the vector similarity measures um, to get the similarity between these two words, um, we'll see that these vectors are orthogonal. So similarity is going to be zero. Um, so it's not gonna, that representation is not going to, it's not going to help us. Uh, so we need um, a better representation that can be able to capture similarity between, between the words. Um, <clears throat> so we can use then the context uh, in which the word does appear. I've got um, two set of uh, sentences here. I've got the one in blue and the other one in yellow. I guess people at the back can see that. Um, so I've got the first one, a variety of plant life in South Africa, an entire plant kingdom inside our, you, it finishes there. Uh, if we look at it, we can see that, um, what, okay, can I ask a question? What's, what's the meaning carried by the word plant there? What's the sense carried by the word plant on the uh, on the on the on the blue, anybody? What's the word sense carried by the word plant on the blue, on the one shaded in blue? What do you understand could that word plant could mean? Leaves. Sorry, leaves. leaves. Yeah. Okay, everything. everything that is plant. Okay, the ones on the on the yellow. Hello? It's a factory, isn't it? And how, what did we use to get to the sense that it's carrying? We're just looking at the words that are, na are neighboring the, the word we are interested in, isn't it? So we can actually use the context in which the word appears to get uh, the meaning that a word is actually, is actually carrying. Um, um, so we would want to use um, that concept. And um, the concept of word embeddings um, or word representations uh, is actually based on that, on that concept. You're just looking at in the context, the word does appear and try and decode the sense it is carrying from its, uh, uh, from its context. Um, <clears throat> if you have got uh, such a representation, uh, for instance, here I've got the word car. It has got this vector representation. Um, I can be able to, this is just showing a two-dimensional view of it. I can be able to group different words uh, based on, um, uh, on, on, on the two-dimensional plane that I do have here. The word car, bus, van, because they appear in similar concepts, uh, uh, context, they're more likely to carry the same, uh, the same senses. You've got silly, foolish, and wise, uh, striking, bright, vivid, and you've got plain, there is more like an outlier so it's, it's, um, uh, that we do have over there. Uh, so how do we then create um, such um, uh, word vector representations? Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with an example that I do have here. Suppose that's my corpus over there. I have uh, the word, I enjoy flying. I like NLP, I like deep learning. Uh, the first thing that I try to, uh, to do is to create a um, word co-occurrence matrix, uh, like what I do have here. Um, so what we're simply doing here, we're saying, um, I've got the word I, how many times does the word I appear in the neighborhood of I? Okay. So you put the number there, the word like, appear in the neighborhood of the word um, I, it appears twice. And here we're using a window size of one, isn't it? We're just using a window size of one away from uh, the word that we are, we are interested in. Uh, so that gives us uh, something of, um, of that nature. Are we together? And now once we have got something of that nature, uh, we would want now uh, to have a word vector representation of it. So if we're using SVD-based methods, uh, what you simply do is to do your singular value decomposition. So you, given a matrix, you can be able to decompose it into three components. Um, your matrix, which is uh, V here is just the size of the vocabulary. So it's just um, the size of the vocabulary across the size of the vocabulary. Uh, then this is the matrix of uh, singular values, the di diagonal elements of the singular values. Uh, and this is another, another matrix, which is um, a V um, a cross V as well. Um, so what we would want to do is to get 
are some singular values which explain most of the variability in our, um, in our data coherence matrix. Uh, so what we do is we just have a cut-off point uh, where we say we want to take the first um, k singular values uh, and then ignore all the other singular vectors that uh, in, in matrix U and also in matrix, in matrix V. Uh, so we end up having a matrix of this, of this form. Um, and then we take this matrix, uh, which is U cross V, as um, um, the matrix which is uh, each row in this matrix will be having what we call the word embeddings. Uh, so it gives us something of this nature. It will give us something of this nature. That's what it will give us. So if you do your singular value decomposition, what usually we have, this is a word to concept, uh, word to concept matrix, your singular values, concept to word matrix. Are we together? Uh, so the, con the word to concept matrix gives you uh, the vectors that that um, characterizing the meaning which is being carried by a given word. Um, so you can just take the rows in your U matrix um, as, your, as your word vectors. So you use th that one to represent, uh, to represent meaning. Uh, what are the problems with the SVD-based methods? Um, the first one, they do not scale well for big matrices. Um, you're talking of, um, if you've got a given language, you're talking of um, uh, millions of words within a given language. Uh, so you're, you're starting with the data matrix, uh, which is very, which is very big. Um, it is hard to incorporate new words. Uh, once you have computed it, um, if you to incorporate new words, you have to do recomputation. Uh, computational costs for an M cross N uh, data matrix, it will be all M uh, N squared. Um, so that's, that's very expensive to compute. Um, so there are a number uh, of solutions that have been proposed. Uh, but the images of deep learning introduce iterative-based methods of um, calculating these um, word vector representations. So instead of using your singular value decomposition, you can then use um, um, some um, neural uh, network-based um, um, solutions for, for doing so. Um, <coughs> um, so instead of um, storing the global information about the word occurrences, uh, what we do, we use an um, iteration-based method uh, which design a model uh, whose parameters uh, are word vectors um, uh, for predicting. So the models will be for, for, for predicting the target word given the context or predicting the context given the target word. Then the parameters of that model are the ones which are going to give you your word vectors. Um, so I'm going to look at how, how that, is, um, that is done. Uh, so your word to vec overview, word to vec, um, it was um, um, uh, proposed by um, Mikolov in 2013 is a framework for learning the vectors. Um, the idea is we have got a very large corpus. Um, every word um, in a fixed vocabulary is represented by some vector, and usually we use your one word vector representation, which we have talked of uh, uh, before. Uh, so we go through each position in the text, and we're trying to get the context around uh, that position. Um, and the context, we can define a, a window, a context window for, for a given word. We can choose to have a context of a window of size two, size three, as it, uh, as it goes. Um, <clears throat> um, so word to vec itself, it is a software which have got two algorithms, uh, the, um, the continuous bag of words and the skip gram uh, algorithm, uh, and two training models, I like for soft marks and negative sampling. This is just there for optimization. Uh, because you'll be dealing with a giant matrix. So I'm not going to look at these ones. I'm just going to concentrate on the continuous bag of words uh, and the skip gram. Uh, so in the continuous bag of words, uh, like what I said, we, what we'll be trying to do is we'll be trying to have a model which when I give you the context, uh, I can predict the target word or the center word. So I've got Africa is ready to use uh, the power of uh, AI, and I want to have a meaning representation uh, for the word use. Uh, and we are using uh, the context of size of size two, the window of size two. So we're going to go two words before it and two words after it. So we'd want to build a neural network model uh, that when I'm given this context, I can predict, I can predict that word. Uh, so that's, that's, that's how the continuous bag of words work. Uh, and um, the, the parameters that we are going to learn to move from this, um, the input, uh, to this hidden layer are the ones which are going to give us the word vectors. Um, um, are the ones which are going to give us our, our word vectors. Uh, so how do they, how, how, how does the continuous bag uh, uh, of word algorithm work? 
Um, so you generate your one hot um, um, representation of your words. Uh, this is the representation zeros everywhere and only one at the index which is corresponding to that, uh, to that word. Um, then what you do, you get, um, your, uh, get your embedded word vectors um, uh, for a given context. Uh, so here we're having a context of size M. So you're looking at uh, M, words, M words before the center word uh, and M words after the, after the center word. Uh, so here, you, the, 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 the set of parameters that you're, gonna, you're going to use, you're just using it to, uh, to initialize your iteration because you're going to try and optimize what's this best set of parameters that can give me the language model. That set of parameters is the one which is going to help you to give you your, um, your, word, your, word, your word embeddings. Um, so then after you've gotten um, uh, those ones, um, you then move on to get the average vector uh, over all the context words. Uh, so this is for context word one. Um, 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 so if I'm having um, a, a, a wind of size two, this is um, two words before, one word um, before, then I have one word after as it, as it goes. Um, once you have got that, we then generate um, the Z scores. Um, so this is just being uh, coming from the multiplication of these vectors and the weights that we get from there. Um, after ge generating the z-score, which is just u um, multiplied by that vector, uh, the average we got from there, uh, we sum, um, turn the scores into probabilities by using a softmax um, uh, squashing function. The softmax squashing function is just a function which takes a um, um, real valued function and squashes it into a range between zero and one. Uh, so you've got your values ranging from minus infinity to infinity. You want them to range between zero and one. So you just use your, um, uh, your softmax function. Um, have, you, have you met the softmax function anywhere in the introductory? You've met it. Is there anybody who have not met the softmax function? Uh, okay, I'll explain it later. I have got it um, later. I'll, I'll, I'll give an explanation for it. Um, <coughs> so what we're trying to do is we would want um, to keep iterating this up until we have got those, the vector V, uh, the optimal parameters for, uh, for that, vector, that vector V. And that vector V will give us um, our, um, our, um, our, our, our um, word embedding. So this is how it will work. Africa is ready for use, um, um, to use um, the power of AI. Uh, so I've got, here I'm using a context of size, um, a window of size one. So I'm just gonna look at um, the word two, one before, and the, the one, word, one word after. Um, so I'll have a one hot representation of the word true, one hot representation of the word the. Um, then I start with some initial parameters, learn the hidden layer here, um, um, learn the hidden layer here with the, the parameters that I'm starting off. So I'm starting with V. Uh, this is just the, the size of the uh, the word embeddings that I would want to have. How big, how big it should be my vector of word embeddings. Um, <coughs> um, then from there, <coughs> I, get my, I, I, I take, get my V, I multiply it by the one hot recording vector for, uh, for the word true. Uh, this is what I have, I have something of, uh, I'll have something of this nature. So this is the initial estimation of the word embeddings based on the initial parameters that we, we we started with. So this is, this is more like just a selection function, which is selecting this, this row of word embedding. So this matrix V gives you the word embeddings. Uh, so this becomes the word embedding, embeddings for the word, uh, for the word two. Um, I can do the same for the word thing um, as well. Um, the word thing, use the one word um, representation of it that will select that um, as the word embedding for the word, for the word thing. Uh, uh, then we continue doing that, iterating, checking whether our error uh, is, getting, is getting lesser, and we continue iterating up until we have met convergence. Uh, and this matrix, when we have gotten to convergence, it will be giving us, um, it will be giving us um, uh, our word, our word, uh, word embeddings. Uh, so in the learning process, what we'll be trying to do, um, our loss function will be comparing them um, the one hot encoding for the word use um, and what has been predicted. Uh, so your loss function will just be comparing these this two. And we want to minimize the difference between these two. So once we have minimized the difference, we go to that vector V, 
um, that will be um, um, that will give us our word 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 embeddings. Um, so that that's um, that 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 matrix there is giving us our our word embeddings. I don't know whether I've got any questions so far um, on what we have covered. Continuous bag of words. I've I've noticed that you use sentences like in the previous example. I forgot the sentence. But what if what if you perhaps removes um, certain words, like say in the sentence, where is the car? Yeah. And then you remove is the, so it'll be just where car. Um, with, with the algorithm and like the computer being able to understand your sentence, wouldn't that be easier then to use with your bag of words and your algorithm? Since it's a smaller bag, smaller bag of words and it identifies the main the main idea of the sentence. So if you're using SVD best method, that's one other solution. Remember I said the SVD methods, they, they create a very giant, a very big matrix, a giant matrix, and computation becomes computationally um, expensive. So usually the solution is, the solution is to try and remove those stop words and only deal with words that are highly discriminative. But if you're using the iterative best method, it, it doesn't matter, your parameters, your, your, your parameters determine how big, uh, how much computation you need, uh, and it's constant. Uh, so you won't, you won't have such an explosion. So with iterative best method, you don't have to do that. But if you're using SVD, you can, you can, you can actually um, be able to reduce how computationally expensive the, the computation is uh, by leaving the stop words. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, so from the continuous bag of words, um, <coughs> Uh, this is the, just the objective function, so you're just using the cross entropy as the objective function. You want to compare um, the one what encoding for the target word uh, to what, the, what has been predicted from the context. Uh, that's what you're simply doing, and you want to minimize um, uh, that, um, that, that, that function. And uh, I will not go to the mathematics around it, um, uh, but this is, this is the final objective function you would want, you would want to optimize. And, um, um, <coughs> it's coming from what we're looking at here. Um, this is what you would want to do finally, to, for you to be able to get um, the predicted uh, word, word vectors there. Uh, so this is what you will have. Uh, and uh, I was talking of the soft, um, the, the soft max function. This is the soft max function I do have here. Uh, I've got u transpose, um, a dot product u transpose and v. Uh, this will give me a real valued function, which is ranging from minus infinity to infinity, uh, but we want to squash it to be ranging between zero and one. Uh, so the first thing we do is we take an exponent of it that forces it to be ranging from zero to infinity. Uh, once after we've taken the, expo the exponent of it, we can then normalize it over all the words. Uh, so this will then create a probability distribution over all the words. Um, so this is, this is what, uh, this is a softmax function um, <coughs> we have here. It doesn't include the negative. Um, just, just this one gives us the softmax function. Um, um, the skip gram, it does the opposite of what um, the continuous bag of, bag of words does. Uh, so instead of saying, given the context, try and predict the target word, we're saying, given the target word, try and predict the context. Um, so it's another way of looking at it. Uh, so you've got the word use is the target word would want to predict the word um, ready to um, the and power. Um, so it, you, you're having, um, um, uh, you just vice versa what we're having on the uh, continuous bag of words um, and try, given the target word, we try and predict the context that appears um, around the word. Um, and the way it works is uh, we generate our one word encoding uh, vectors uh, for them uh, for the sender word, uh, we get the embedded word vector um, uh, for the sender word. This is just initialization of uh, the algorithm. Generate the, uh, the score vector um, and then apply our softmax function. Uh, what we're trying to do is now we're predicting the context given the word. Uh, we would want to check whether when we do our softmax we'll be able to get something closer to the one hot uh, representation of the original words that we were, we were having. Um, and what it will do is it will simply change how we look at the um, objective function when you iteratively learn the parameters. Um, here we are now interested in the probability 
of the context given, uh, given the center word. Um, but we know that there are dependencies between uh, these words which are within the context. Um, we make a naive base assumption that this appearance of these words is, um, uh, is independent once I'm given the context so we can apply the probability. So it just changes um, um, the, the loss function uh, when you're learning that. Okay, so that's, that's um, it about um, your, your word embeddings. So you're trying to get a meaning representation um, which is based on those dense, uh, on those dense, dense factors. Uh, once you have gotten those, uh, usually for natural language processing, we then use recurrent neural networks for doing different tasks. Uh, you can use recurrent neural networks for language modeling. You can use them for part of speech tagging, uh, named entity recognition. I think some of you might have met those ones being used. Uh, machine translation, sequence to sequence models are doing much better than your traditional statistical based models, uh, alignment based models for uh, machine translation. Um, so I'm just going to use language modeling as a way of uh, motivating uh, the use of RNNs in um, N NLP. Uh, so a language, um, a language model, what it does is um, you will be trying to predict the probability of a sequence of words. You will be trying to predict the probability of a sequence of words. Um, so you want to get the probability <coughs> uh, of what I have, I have over there. Um, um, but we know that these words they also have got dependencies between them. So what we do is we make an assumption um, that um, the probability of one word appearing after a sequence of words depends um, on a few words before it. Uh, for instance, if we're having um, um, uh, a trigram, this is we're looking at, at the history of two words, uh, we would want to estimate this probability uh, by multiplying these individual probabilities. So we're saying the word, the appearance of X, XT in any given uh, sentence depends on the previous two words that have been, that have been observed. Um, so <coughs> estimating those, um, um, that, that prob that this probability, you usually just use your counting processes, uh, maximum likelihood estimation of them. So you're just gonna go into your, your, your training corpus. Uh, you're gonna count how many times did the word xt appear um, after xt minus one and xt minus one. Uh, you divide it by the occurrence of, of this, the sequence that's appearing before, before it. So this is the maximum likelihood estimation of what, what we have here, the parameters for a, uh, for a, for a language model. Um, so what are the problems with, with um, Ngram-based language models? Um, we said it's given by th that formula over there. Um, the first problem is um, data sparsity. What if that numerator is not there in your corpus? Uh, if your numerator, that numerator is not there in your corpus, uh, you're gonna get a zero count for it. Uh, then you multiply all the other probabilities that you have gotten by a zero. Everything becomes zero. And uh, that's a problem for, uh, for your language modeling. Um, so you've got this, you're multiplying quite a number of things here, T, th t things uh, that you're multiplying, but one of them is a zero. Uh, so if you then multiply them through, everything becomes zero. Uh, there are techniques like smoothing um, of, of avoiding the zeros, but th those are, are usually a problem. Um, then the other problem is the storage. Uh, your n-grams will take a lot of space uh, because it's exponential on the, on the size of your n. Uh, so it will take a lot, of, um, a lot of space. So we'd want solutions that don't take um, that much space. Um, and the window can never be large enough uh, to cover um, long distance relationships between words. Um, so we, if we're having trigrams, we're just gonna look at two words before the word we are interested in, in our language modeling. Um, there could be some other words that appeared before those two words we are looking at that, um, that can actually determine the occurrence of a given word within, uh, within a, given, a given sentence, and that will not be able to capture that. Uh, and the other, the other one is semantic similarity is not exploited. So suppose I've got a language model uh, that have got um, the probability of met appearing after this sequence of words. Uh, my cat set on there, um, and the probability of met appearing after this sequence is that. Uh, we know that met and drag might mean may carry the same sense. But if this did not, did not appear in our corpus, um, we will not be able to predict the word drag. Uh, will not be able to predict the word drug, um, and your, your n-gram-based models, um, they definitely miss that. 
Um, so one solution is to go to um, um, fixed window neural language models. Uh, we're still fixing the window um, to, a given, to a given N, uh, but this is just to give an appreciation of how neural networks uh, would, would work. Um, so you have your words here. The students open there. So this is the given context, the words that you have seen. You want to predict what will be the word which will come after the word there. Um, <clears throat> so you have your, your one word encoding representation. Uh, we have already looked at how you can have your word embeddings, be it from your skip gram or context, uh, your, your continuous bag of words. Uh, you've got your, Im your, your, your word embeddings, so you, you concatenate them, uh, and then you try to learn a new, some parameters. Um, that we can use to optimize prediction of, of, of words. Uh, so the language model here um, can actually be able to help you to predict which words is more likely to come after this sequence. And you can see here for the word books, uh, it has got higher probability because we're gonna use a softmax function. It's gonna squash this to make it a probability. Uh, so we, can, we are more likely to have the word books or laptops coming after it. Uh, but if we're using these ones as well, we still have got some problems. Of course, we see we have made some improvement. Uh, no data sparsity problems, uh, which will arise if we're using um, um, neural language models. Um, the model is no longer, um, uh, time complexity is no, space complexity is no longer um, uh, an exponent of n. It's now O n. But we still have got a problem. We have got a fixed window. So long distance relationships between, or dependencies between words will not be captured. Um, enlarging the window, um, will enlarge the set of uh, parameters that we need to learn. Uh, so we're going back to what we're having on language models as well. Uh, so we need an architecture that can process uh, any length of words that have been seen before the word we want, we want to predict. And that's where the recurrent neural networks then, uh, then come in. Uh, so your recurrent neural networks, uh, what, they, what, the, what they do is um, you have got a set of um, uh, repeated um, neural network units um, um, in time. So you've got the first word, the second word, the third word as it goes. Um, you want to predict the second word. You're gonna use what you have gotten, a uh, hidden model that you've gotten from the previous word as input. You're gonna use also the word um, um, that, that, you, that you have seen as input uh, and try and use it to estimate, to predict what's, uh, what's the next word to come there. And the good thing about it in terms of the model, this parameter W is shared. Uh, this parameter W is shared. Um, you don't have, we have a W for this, um, for this time, and for the next time another W, you're just gonna use the same, uh, the same W. So you, the parameters are applied uh, repeatedly. Uh, so you have something of this nature. So you start with your one hot encoding of your, of your words, um, zeros everywhere, one for, uh, the index that corresponds to the word that you're interested in um, um, as, as the word that you have seen. Then you do your continuous bag of words or your skip grams uh, to get your word embeddings. Uh, then you use your word embeddings as input. Uh, so the word embeddings will carry the meaning. Uh, so it's now different from using your scene sets, um, use your uh, word net and what have you. So you're now using your word, your, your word embeddings to give uh, the meaning which is carried by this word. So what it means if I've got the word met and the word drag will be close to each other. So if I want to do predictions here, it's now possible to represent something that is similar. Uh, if I've got the word met, it's more now possible to, um, to predict something that is similar to, um, uh, to the word to the word met. So that gives your neural, uh, neural language models. Um, <clears throat> limitations of um, uh, recurrent, neural, um, uh, recurrent neural networks for language modeling. Um, the advantages, we can have any length of input. Um, this is coming from the fact that we're keeping the history. Uh, so the, what has been learned here is being um, um, carried here, is being carried there, carried there up until we predict uh, the way that we are, we are interested in over there. Um, <clears throat> so any, any length input can actually, can actually um, long, long distance relationships can actually be used in the prediction for the uh, for the next for the next word, um, and uh, I will use that in quotes. Any any length input. There is another problem that I will discuss uh, later, uh, which which makes this somehow not uh, somehow not true. 
um, uh, for the computation um, uh, step, this is where you're now taking the history, you're combining it with what we have seen, and you try and predict the next hidden layer up until you predict the web that you're interested in. Um, and we're saying some of the advantages that you do have there, recurrent, neural, uh, recurrent uh, computation is very slow. In practice, it is difficult to access information from many, many steps back. And I'll explain why, why that, is, uh, that is a problem. Uh, because we'll be uh, training a neural network, it is important to know the objective function mm -hmm. that we'll be using. Uh, we'll still be using the cross entropy objective function, um, which, is, um, which is given by, by the formula over there. Uh, and then we just average it over um, uh, the, different, the different ways that we, uh, we, are, we are predicting. Uh, so when you're training it, so your objective function, you're just gonna get an object, um, the, um, that, that value for each and every word, uh, it, for each and every time or every term as you go along um, uh, your observations uh, and then just get the average, uh, the average over there. Um, but one problem we will have with, uh, with this is um, capturing long distance relations becomes very difficult and that comes from the problems of exploding um, and uh, vanishing uh, gradients. Um, if we to get uh, the gradient um, of, 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 of that one relative to um, the, the first parameter uh, that you have there in your hidden layer, uh, we, c we can get it by, by using the chain rule. Uh, so it will be partial derivative of that, of that one um, dh1 by dh4 at dh2. So this will cancel. Uh, but we still need to get um, dh, uh, j4 and j, uh, h2 are computed. Uh, so we use chain rule again. Uh, we get some, um, something of that nature. We use chain rule again. We get um, um, what we have here. So the whole derivative is given by this, uh, by this whole function using, uh, using the, chain, the chain rule. But what happens if these values are close to zero? Uh, if they're close to zero, as we move in time in our observations, we'll be multiplying things that are close to zero. Uh, so as we move towards the way that we would want to predict, the effect of this um, is going to be reduced. Uh, and that's the concept of the vanishing gradient. Because you keep on multiplying something which is close to zero, uh, and as you keep on multiplying to it, the long the, the, its effect on, on what we're now trying to predict will be diminished because they've been mul multiplied over and over with something which is, um, which is closer to zero. Uh, that is if we, we are doing a um, um, vanishing gradient. If the explosive gradient, if this happens to be greater than one, uh, we keep multiplying something which is greater than one, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and also that will, that will cause problems because your, your solution will not converge. Um, um, your iteration will keep then jumping uh, from one side of the slope to the other side of, uh, uh, of the slope. Um, so you have a problem there. Uh, so the, the vanishing gradient, I've already explained it. Uh, if it's closer to zero, it will keep multiplying by something closer to zero and it gets to zero, the effect will be, uh, will be reduced. Uh, now, how do we fix um, the vanishing gradient problem? Um, uh, the main problem, um, is it's difficult to, to learn um, uh, recurrent neural networks that can preserve information over a, ma a lot of steps uh, because of the vanishing gradient that we have uh, spoken of. We keep multiplying this um, with some value which is, greater, which is less than zero uh, and it tends to get uh, close to zero. So one solution is to, to have some memory, some, some, some memory units that we can then use. Uh, to keep what is important as we, as we learn our parameters. Uh, so that takes us to long short term memory. Um, that is um, a recurrent special type of recurrent neural networks. And you've got gated recurrent neural networks. Um, so this um, was created as a way of creating something that is computationally uh, feasible. Because the long, long short term memories are, um, um, they are computationally uh, expensive to compute. Um, so the long short term memory, uh, what it does, I think the key thing here to note is um, uh, at each and every step t, that is at a given word, uh, there is a hidden state and the, there is a cell state. Uh, this cell state is the one which is going to keep, keep the memory. Uh, so both are vectors of size n. The cell state um, uh, stores the long-term information that we need to make the current, uh, the current prediction. So it is the one which is used to erase uh, some memory 
uh, write some memory through to read the memory that will be needed um, uh, in the next uh, in the next computation. Uh, so what you do have mathematically, um, your LSTM will look more like this. Uh, so you have a forget get. Uh, this lends uh, what what to remember um, and what to what to forget. Um, so here is just looking at the history. So the parameters we have here are trying to these parameters in there, we're trying to weigh which memory is important at the current state where we are. Uh, so this is the current input, the current observation, the current word you're observing in your, um, in your, uh, in, in your, in your input. Um, what we do have here is the hidden state from the previous word. So you, um, you, you're learning how to, how to forget um, the history. Um, here, this is just a sigmoid function we're using um, uh, to squash, because this one is going to give us a real valued function. We want to squash it to between 0 and 1. And um, a sigmoid function is also one other function which can be used to do so. Uh, then you have the input get. Uh, this lens um, how to make the input important. Um, so it will have its own parameters. This is wf for the forget get. This is wi uh, for, uh, for the input get. Um, and the corresponding hue for it. Then you've got the output get. Um, this is also learning how important is the output coming from the current, uh, the current term or the current term, the current um, word that we have observed. So it's going to give us the parameters to be able to do so. Uh, here we're now combining uh, the new cell content. It's going to have um, um, the new, the what, what's coming from the previous cell. Um, multiplied by what we're going to get from the current cell and the bias factor. Um, then we have got the cell state. We, we remember we said it keeps the cell state. So this is the one which learns to forget. So it will use um, this function over there, um, the parameters from that function, um, the FT, and the parameters from the input, uh, the input function as it goes. Uh, so this is how the long short term memory works. So you've got quite a number of units of those, of those um, um, uh, LSTMs. Uh, so this is one unit uh, which will be having uh, the different gets that we have here. Uh, so you have your forget, get, um, your forget, um, um, uh, you've got your, your, your cell state over there. Uh, this is your, 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 your history over here. Uh, so you would want to know how much of the history should go to the cell state, how much of the current input should go to the cell, to the cell state. Uh, so um, you forget, uh, forget some content cell, that, that is, you get it from multiplying, because that one is gonna give you a function which is between zero and one. Uh, if you have got it, if it is actually zero, it means you are forgetting everything from the history. So you're multiplying C T minus one by zero. If you want to remember what's coming from that cell, uh, it, it, if you're having one, then it will remember everything that's coming from the, uh, from the, previous, uh, from the, previous, the previous cells. Um, so what you would want to do is to keep updating uh, the history as we go uh, along your, uh, your observations. Um, <coughs> LSTM, does it uh, solve the vanishing gradient problem? Um, it doesn't really solve the vanishing gradient problem, but what it does is uh, it only learns how to, what to remember, uh, what to remember from the history. The vanishing gradient problem still rema remains, but it, 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 it knows what to remember as you go through your, um, uh, your observations. Um, besides the LSTM, we also have got the gated recurrent, neuro, uh, recurrent units, that's um, a GRIU. Uh, this was proposed uh, in 2014. Uh, it was proposed as a um, less expensive alternative to your LSM. Um, so what we do, what we have here, will not have the the cell state, um, but we use the re reset get um, to to choose whether to remember the history um, or or to to ignore it. So the get still have got a sigmoid function, uh, so it's still ranging from zero to one. Uh, so what you would want to have for this current state would want to check how much should we remember from the previous one, which we get from. Um, the, re the reset get, and how much should we get from the current observation, which we'll get from uh, the update from the current observation that we have just made, and what we would want to have is a new state as we, as we, move, uh, as we move along. Uh, so this is how it looks um, diagrammatically. 
uh, you have got your reset get there, um, uh, you have got your update get there. So you would want this is giving this is learning how uh, what to remember from the history and what not to remember. Here you just multiplying the history uh, with what has been learned here. Uh, if you have got a zero coming from here, the history is going to be totally ignored because you're just going to multiply what's coming here by from here by zero. If you want it to be uh, uh, remembered, uh, what comes here will be a one. Uh, so what the parameter which will be learned from here will be just a one multiplying um, the history here. Uh, here you, this is your current input, um, the current way that you have observed. Um, so you're just combining this, what's coming from the history and what have been observed. You squash it um, and then you also want to check um, whether it's important uh, to update uh, HT um, as you as you go along, so this also does uh, does the same thing here. Um, so LSTMs versus um, GRA Hughes um, researchers have proposed quite a number of uh, RNN uh, variants um, um, to uh, to LSTM 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 and GRA Hughes, um, but those two are the ones which are mostly used. Um, the biggest difference between the GRA Hughes and the LSTM is the GRA Hughes is much quicker. Um, um, and it has got fewer parameters. Uh, however, there's no conclusive um, evidence that um, the GRIU performs better than the LSTM or the LSTM performs better than the GRIU. Uh, LSTM is a good default choice, um, especially if your data is particularly, particularly has got long distance relationships. Um, if you see that your LSTM is taking too much time to train, then you can, uh, you can choose to go back, uh, to go down to your GRA, your GRA hill. Uh, so the rule, rule of thumb is start with an LSTM. If it's not working for you, then you go down to uh, your GRA, your GRA hill. Um, uh, the last slide I have is just some acknowledgement. Uh, some of the slides that I used, they came from Abigail C's lecture slides. They are on those, um, those resources. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jembere, for um, your nice presentation. Uh, my question, uh, it's not a question really, um, it's just to hear your comments about um, how you feel these models are going to be affected by um, the way language is dynamic. We, we do understand that um, language is dynamic. There's new phrases and new um, words being introduced in our languages. Um, how are these models going to be affected? Are they still going to be relevant in the future or are they going to become obsolete? Um, just your views on how you think um, the models are going to be affected by dynamism of the languages. So, so for dynamism of the language will be covered by what corpus are you going to use. Um, so if, 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 if you would want to have, say, for instance, if I start with word embeddings, if you would want to have word embeddings that capture most of the, uh, the language which is used, sub, suppose, on social networks, you need to have a corpus on social networks. Then it will learn it will learn the word embeddings for the new words that are coming with, with, with social networks. Uh, so what you do have is just an algorithm. Uh, what you get, it depends on your corpus that you, that you have, yeah. Lovely presentation, man. Um, I just have a question. How would these models uh, interpret uh, multiple uh, languages, especially African languages? Uh, let's say, for example, Lingala, Kosa, um, Zulu, yeah, and for, say for instance, like I speak to you in multiple languages, like hey, info way to how are you doing? Like hey, info way to is hey man, like hey my brother, but and how are you doing is like yeah, you all understand how you doing is. So how would these models interpret those those uh, that text? <coughs> usually, for for for, for, for th these models, usually they are, they 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 usually work at at word level. Um, so you see we're talking of the word embeddings, uh, the work at word level. But if you move for language to languages like your Isu Zulu, uh, Isis Kosa, they are what we call agglutinative languages. Um, so if they are agglutinative, what we mean is the words are very productive. Uh, you can hear a word for the first time in Zulu, which you have never heard, but you will know what it means based on the, the, the stems and the affixes that have been added to, to the words. Uh, so usually one way of, of being able to deal with those aspects is uh, to do what is known as morphological analysis. You look at your words, 
you disintegrate them to the affixes and, um, and, and the stems, and you do your language modules and your embeddings at, that, at the level of the morphemes, um, of the affixes and the stems. When it comes to machine translation, um, uh, machine translation uh, ge generally it needs your, your parallel corpus. Uh, that, that's the general solution. You need a corpus which have got, uh, if you want to do translation from uh, English to Isizulu, you need a corpus that have got Isizulu, um, and the English, so that you can be able to map, um, uh, to map the languages. So what you do in most of these models, you, you, you try and learn how can you translate from this language to this. So usually for, for if it's machine translation, what you do is you will need a model that captures, um, that is faithful to the meaning carried in the, in the source language. You should be able to carry the meaning to the target language. That, that's the faithfulness aspect of it. The other aspect is, would you be able to give a fluent sentence in the, in the target language? And that is to deal with language models that we are discussing. Language models just says, if I've seen this set of words, or how likely is it that I'll see the next word? Uh, it becomes also a problem for languages like Isizolo, because it's agglutinative as well. Uh, if you use your language models, you're going to have a lot of zero counts. Um, the data sparsity comes in, your language model is going to be very poor. So one way of dealing it of, with it is, uh, is go back to your morphemes, um, do morphological analysis, have the, the different parts of the word, and do your language modeling at that, at that level.